Welcome. Thank you all very much for coming. Indeed, a great event. And this will be my first public lecture as professor. And it's about bioaccumulation of pharmaceuticals, a topic I worked on many years. And it's not only bioaccumulation, it's generally organic electrolytes in the environment. It's a yeah, relatively special topic, but that's what I worked on. To introduce myself, I mean, some of you know me perhaps. My name is Stefan Trapp, and I was born in Germany, in Bayern. I made my diploma in ecology and hydrology, and then made a small step to biology and plant uptake, and habilitated in mathematics to become an engineer. Um, I was appointed as lector, as applied lector in applied ecology here. And brand new, now I'm professor for environmental chemistry here. My research is on environmental chemistry, surprise, kinetics, processes, modeling, metabolism, toxicity, plant uptake. Yeah, to go into the topic, how many chemicals do we have on the world? I mean, synthesized were dozens, if not hundreds of millions. There are more than 30 millions described in the chemical uptrack service. And not all of them are used. 140,000, more than 140,000 are produced for the European market, also about 100,000 are produced by plants and all, and then we have metabolites of this compound. So there are hundred thousands of chemicals we have to look at in the environment. In the European Union, 104, 3,000 chemicals had been registered for the REACH, for the new law, we come back to this. We have a chemical production of 350 million tons per year. That's how many tons per head? About one ton and more than 1,000 chemicals with more than 1,000 tons per year. And are these dangerous? Well, could be, no? Could be. To avoid that, we have a new chemical law called REACH, Registration, Evaluation, Authorization, and Restriction of Chemicals. And the full name is <gasps> Regulation EC number 19-07-2006 of the European Parliament of the Council of the 8th December concerning registration of chemicals, establishing a European Chemicals Agency, amending Directive 1999-45 EC, and repealing, and so on. That is the typical language. This is actually a very good law. Before we had this, we had another risk assessment, and there the authorities had to prove that there is harm from a chemical. And it was very slow. There was delay, and there were maybe 300 chemicals out of the 100,000 had been tested, but very few had actually been evaluated. Now here in REACH, it's the opposite. The industry has to register their chemicals. So for each chemical on the market, we get a risk assessment. Each chemical above one ton. The timeline is like this. Uh, the 2007, the new regulation went into force and into operation 2008. We have a pre-registration phase until end of 2008, and now 10 years' time to register all these chemicals. All chemicals on the market that are imported, exported, or produced. This costs a fortune, 10 billion euro, approximately up to 30 billion. And it's a little bit delayed. We have by now 7,362 substances really registered, and three are under consideration for risk management or ban, among them lead. How is this done? The principle of this risk assessment is the old principle, dosis facet venum. All substances are poisons. Only the right dose differentiates a poison from a remedy. Paracelsus, 1493 to 1541. So this basic principle the dosage makes the poison, that is still valid and is the basis of chemical safety and risk assessment. In practice, it's compared a PNAC with a PEC. PNAC, predicted no effect concentration, derived by toxicity tests, that are our LG tests, our Daphnia tests that we do in the laboratory. And this is weighed against predicted environmental concentration. And this is done with mathematical models, it uses some models I also worked on. Then if PEC, PNAC, environmental concentration above toxicity, then it's dangerous. If not, can assume no risk. There's a little bit 
an unexpected challenge. In 2010, some of my brave, enthusiastic, motivated students took these 143,000 registered chemicals and took every, every hundredth of it and looked what it is. They looked the Cas number, put it into AZD, looked the structure, looked what type of chemical is it. Is it polar? Is it lipophilic? Is it volatile? Is it an acid or a base? And unexpectedly, about half of them were actually ionizable compounds. 27% acids, 40% bases, and 8% twitter ionics. And only half of them are neutral. And that was unexpected because so far it was assumed that these ionizable compounds are minor, small fraction. And therefore, the models, regressions, and tests used and developed for REACH were primarily developed for neutral compounds. So there's a little complication. Electrolytes, just to repeat that. Electrolytes, you remember from school, an electrolyte is a compound that ionizes when dissolved in suitable solvents, and that makes the water electrolytic. So all most soluble salts, acids and bases. If you put a phenolic compound into water, then it releases an H+, it's an acid. General formula like this. You can calculate where at which pH it dissociates with the henderson hasselbalch equation. And this equation we will need. Phi n is the fraction neutral at a certain pH. This was invented by a famous Danish scientist, or what means invented, discovered. Johannes Nikolaus Brønste. So this ionization, which effect does it have? We take as example trimethoprim, it's a weak base, the pKa is at 7. It dissociates here. And that means at 7 it's half neutral and half ionized. So below pH 7 it's, free, it's present as a cation with a charge of plus 1, and above it's neutral. So the ion that is charged, of course, it has a plus 1 charge. It has a strong dipole moment, because the plus is interacting with water molecules. This makes it hydrophilic. Hydrophilic means that it likes to go into water. This makes the partition coefficient 3 to 4 units lower, log units lower. So what is a partition coefficient? I interrupt myself and explain the partition coefficient. If you have two non-mixable phases, like here, olive oil and water, you see olive oil are the yellow bullets. They don't mix with the water. Now I put in a chemical, like here, the blue ink. The chemical will go into the water or into the olive oil or into both. And the concentration ratio, that is the partition coefficient, log KOW. Partition coefficient octanol water or olive oil water. And log D is the partition coefficient if you have more than one species. Now, if the partition coefficient is 3 to 4 log units lower, the chemical also does not dissolve in membranes. So the velocity of the membrane transfer permeability is also 1,000 to 10,000 times less. That means the cation and the neutral compound are two totally different compounds. And the ratio is determined by the pH. So having found this, we have some questions. What is the effect of ionization? When acids and bases ionize, do the adsorption change, the bioaccumulation change, the toxicity change, or stay the same? Because we need these properties for the risk assessment. And so part of this work has been done by our team, and I show some highlights out of that. We start with the adsorption. The adsorption to soil, sediments, sewage sludge these things. It's described by the partition coefficient, organic carbon to water, KOC. And we had a whole PhD thesis on this by Antonio Franco, who is maybe live here, you see, hello to Unilever. These are results from his PhD. We have here the log KOW, log P, and here the partition coefficient, octanol, uh, organic carbon, KOC. And we have anions, acids neutral, cations, bases neutral. And we see for the anions a very weak relation, R square, 0 0.09, and very low values. Acids, if they are neutral, have a very strong relation and go up very high, up to 6. R square is 0 0.81. That means the acids absorb 
strongly, and when they dissociate, they adsorb weakly. And it's not related much to the organic carbon. With the cations and bases, it's a, a different picture. We see the slope for the cations is much higher than for the bases. And also, you see here we are at zero, and here we are at zero. So the adsorption is also much, much higher. So if bases dissociate, the cation adsorbs much stronger. This, so we can answer our question. Yes, adsorption changes with ionization. And anions adsorb less than the corresponding acids, and cations adsorb stronger than the corresponding bases. And we made new regressions for this KOC and published them and so on. Here is a test of the performance. This is the old regression used in EUSIS. And it has here is calculated, here is experimental, and we have an R square for acids and bases of 0 0.36. And this is the new regression. And it has a R square of 0 0.7, so it predicts about twice as good. Bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulation means how much is taken up into an organism, for example, a fish, when it swims in the water, but also uptake into plants and other organisms. The predictor is the bioaccumulation factor, BCF, which is the concentration in the organism versus concentration in the water. This here is the typical structure of an eukaryotic cell as a neutral compound can see it. It's more or less lipids in water. So the neutral compound, it partitions into the lipids or into the water. And this we can describe by our KOW. So a neutral compound, the BCF, is fraction of water plus fraction of lipids times KOW. And then we have a couple of regressions all based on locker W, for example, fight et al. So these traditional PCF regressions predict uptake into the whole organism and consider water and lipids. Yeah, lipid phase is sometimes very important. This is now the true structure of an animal cell. It's a little bit more complex. It contains, of course, lipids. It contains, of course, water. It's surrounded by a biomembrane. It has the cytoplasm, the cell sap. It has lysosomes, which regulate the recycling of proteins and lipids. It has nucleus DNA, mitochondria, which produce the energy, the power stations of the cell, and other structures like the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, and so on. So it's more complex. So this is the typical structure of an eukaryotic cell as it's seen by an ion. And the ion sees the electrical charge. We are all electrically charged. Yeah, if not, then we are not very active. We are negatively charged, minus 70 millivolt. We have pH differences. The cell sap is slightly alkaline. The lysosomes are strongly acidic, down to pH 4. We have the mitochondria. The mitochondria, they pump out H plus and create ATP, the energy of the cell. So they are very strongly negatively charged, and the pH is high. And this is all seen by ions. They are attracted or repelled by the electricity, and they dissociate based on the pH. To consider this in the bioaccumulation, we developed a small cell model, and it goes like this. We have outside the different species, neutral or ionic, and they can be taken up into the cell across the membrane. It's fast for the neutral species and slow for the ion. Inside, we have a different ratio because the pH is different. And then we can have adsorption to lipids of the neutral or adsorption to proteins, primarily of the ionics. And then we have the other organelles, mitochondria, lysosomes, DNA. And based on this, we have different adsorption, accumulation, and uptake. So each organelle is described by one differential equation. The equations are very harmless, not very difficult. I can easily explain them. <laughs> we have the flux of the neutral molecule across the membrane, described by Fick's first law. Unit flux is permeability, that's the velocity of transfer, times the gradient in activity. This is common and well known. The Nernst Planck equation describes the flux of the ion. Here we also have the velocity. We have no here, the gradient is not only the activity, but also the Nernst potential. 
and we have an influence of electricity on the velocity. So electricity both affects the velocity and the amount of transfer. Yeah, the activity is not the concentration. The relation between activity and concentration is a very basic equation. A times B is C. A is activity. B describes the partitioning. And this together gives the concentration C. So activity A is related to the free dissolved concentration in water. And B is the adsorption. Yeah, we are almost done with equations. Almost. If you want to read more about it, that is all carefully published in a nice paper with Franco and Mackay. So we don't need to go through here. Now what do we see for the bioconcentration? We have here the theoretical prediction. It's a graph showing the effect of log KOW on adsorption and of pKa. And it's basis. So here at this pKa, they are neutral. And here, they are ionized. So we see first this fall here for the lipophilic basis because they dissociate. And we see also that here we have a kind of plateau, which we don't have here. And this is now the electrical attraction of the cations. So they are also attracted by electricity. That means that the slope of BCF versus log W is high for the neutral compounds and low for the ions or for the strong bases. And this is what we see when we compare measured data with log D. We see for the weak bases a high slope and for the strong bases a low slope here. These are the second set of equations today. Yeah? The BCF can be calculated from the velocity of the uptake. If a, this, what we see here in the denominator, is the velocity of the uptake of the neutral and the ionic molecule. And on the denominator, we see a loss from the fish. So we get a ratio of activities. We normally say equilibrium is at equal activity. But if the uptake is fast and the loss is small, we get an accumulation. Then we have a flux equilibrium not equal to 1. And then we have the adsorption to proteins, lipids, and uptake into water, and multiply this and get the concentration in fish. So this replaces the BCF. And since this is difficult to understand in equations, I made a picture. So we have here the same in a picture. We have an acid dissociated neutral. If most of it is neutral, there's much uptake into the cell. And if it then dissociates, it can't come back. You see, molecule is fast taken up, dissociates, trapped. Fast taken up, dissociates, trapped. Fast taken up, dissociates, trapped. So it accumulates. Mm -hmm. And this happens for an acid at low pH and for a base at high pH. That means we get an accumulation by this different velocity of uptake and the pH gradient. And this has been shown and measured. For example, for the herbicide 2,4-D, it has a pKa at 3, and this is the pH. And we see at very high pH, the chemical is outside dissociated, so that means there is no uptake. And the lower the pH gets, the more is taken up. And this is a log scale, so it's a 300-fold accumulation due to this ion trap effect. So it's factor 300 times higher BCF just due to the pH change. And this is amazing. This means we can calculate this uptake into cells from the velocity pH and pKa. But we can not only calculate uptake into cells, we can also predict where in the cells the chemical goes. And this is relevant for the toxicity. For example, these acids, they go into alkaline compartments because there they dissociate. And then they are trapped. This is used in techniques, for example, by herbicides. They are all weak acids, or most of them, because then they accumulate in the phloem. We can also predict uptake into mitochondria, lysosomes, DNA. And this was new. This that we can foresee the intracellular localization. This was not so much an issue for environmental engineers, but it was taken up by medicine. So there are a lot 
interesting studies in medicine that uses this principle, for example, on lipophilic cationic drugs, drugs on antipsychotic drugs, on functional inhibitors of acid sphingomelinase, on tumor cells, lysosomal targeting, DNA delivery, it's a side effect. We call this collateral damage. <laughs> but of course, it's quite nice. These are actually also quite good journals. Good. We come to the third point. Toxicity. Does toxicity change when we have ionization? Well, the uptake changes. So, could be, no? Could be. The toxicity also changes. Now, the problem is that many species don't like if you change the PA from acidic to basic, then they die. So, we worked with trees. I have here such a victim, a willow tree. And we have these. They like pH from 4 up to 10, which is a log scale, so a million times different H plus concentration. So we used these for our studies. And this is based now on the PhD of Cecilia Rendal. We made several studies, one of them is chloroquine. Chloroquine is known to all of those that have been in the tropics. It's used against malaria. And you take it against malaria. Um, it's a bivalent base. It's neutral at high pH and dissociates at low pH. And that's why it's trapped in the lysosomes of the blood and kills the malaria. So we wanted to know whether this is changing the toxicity. This is the partition coefficient, and it changes almost factor 100,000 with pH. So it's an ideal study compound. We switch immediately to the results, which are published, of course, by Cecilia Rendal. This is the pH 6, 7, 8, 9. And here we have pH 6, 7, 8, 9. And here we have the uptake. It goes from low to high with pH. And here we have toxicity. And now, of course, if you have a high effect, you have a high toxicity. So all the trees died at high pH, and half of them survived at low pH, which means that toxicity is factor 10 to 20 times higher for the neutral compound than for the ion which is also a relevant amount. Of course, the question is, does this always happen, or is it only for this compound? We studied 76 compounds, also published. And here we have the difference between pH and pKa. And of course, if it's minus, then we have the chemical here, the acid neutral. And if it's positive, we have it ionized. And here is the relative toxicity. At neutral state, it's 1, and then it falls. That means for acids, we have a fall down to factor 100, 200 of toxicity when the chemical ionizes. For bases, it's the other way around. We have it neutral when pH minus pK is positive. And we see the same, only the other way around. And we have toxicity much lower in ionized state, factor 10, 20, 100. So yes, we can say there is an effect of pH on the toxicity of acids and bases. Weak acids are more toxic at low pH, and weak bases are more toxic at high pH as neutral molecules. We have then also developed tests with different pH, which is not so easy to keep the pH constant, and tested different chemicals. And we found just one exception so far. And in this exception, it's the ion that is toxic. So, summary and conclusions. When acids and bases ionize, adsorption of acids decreases and of bases increases. Bioaccumulation is lower, generally, for the ionic species, without exception, so far. Toxicity is also lower for the ionic species. That means EC50 higher, without exception, except sulfonamides, where it's the ion that is toxic. Yeah, so we have actually managed to answer our three initial questions. What happens if the ion, yeah, if the chemical ionizes? Now I will show one example where we use all this. And that's the environmental fate and the exposure to pharmaceuticals. 
There are several reasons why we use pharmaceuticals. First of all, pharmaceuticals do not fall under reach. That means they are not tested like the other chemicals. So if, if this is, of course, the case, then universities step in and do that. <laughs> so we worked on an environmental risk assessment together with a group of scientists in the EU project Pharmas. Second, I mean, who among you has never taken any pharmaceuticals? Exactly. They are used in high amounts and widespread, and there are 1,000 different pharmaceuticals. And third, of course, most of them are ionizable. Many bases, but also others, acids, twitter ionics, aspirin, for example. Yeah. And another reason is we have a problem. We have at the moment that we see more and more resistance to antibiotica. This is rapidly spreading, and it's perhaps a threat to our health. We lose our weapons against bacteria. So we focused on antibiotics in this study. What did we do? We have a simulation system similar to EUSIS, but taken out a part of it, the part relevant for us. And that is we look at the emissions by human use. Then most of this is excreted into a wastewater treatment plant. Don't say that it's not. There is a model called Simple Treat that calculates fate in wastewater treatment plants. From the wastewater treatment, you have two ways out. That is the effluent water, which goes into rivers. And in the river, we have a dilution and then uptake into fish. And we have the sewage sludge. 60% of the Danish sewage sludge is brought on fields. And then we have the chemicals on soil and plant. This gives a carpet model system. And we modified this model system so that it can calculate for ion compounds. Here is a sketch of the models we used. Simple treat is a wastewater driven model with primary settler, aeration tank, solid liquid separator, sludge phase, and air phase, and through flux. Our soil plant model is a coupled model for transport of water and solutes, several soil layers leaching to groundwater, exchange with air, uptake into roots, then leave fruits with the plant. And for the fish, we used our cell model that I just presented. It's a little bit difficult to calculate for antibiotics because these are very special chemicals. I have here as example chlortetracycline. Tetracyclines are very widely used in Denmark. And we see it has one, two, three acid groups and one base group. It has four groups that can dissociate. This is here the Bierum plot, Bierum, another famous Danish chemist, that shows the fraction of species versus pH. And in the environmental relevant range around pH 7, we have violet is plus minus, twitter ion, and then we have minus 1, minus 2, mono and bivalent acid. Mistake? Mm. And then we see the partition coefficient is extremely low, minus 4. We had normally 5, 6, and here we have minus 4. And it even falls with pH. So these are difficult chemicals. Here is a list of the chemical data for the antibiotics, tetracycline, ciprofloxacin, doxycycline, levofloxacin, oxytracycline, and tetracycline. Log D down to minus 8. Very low. Still, adsorption to soil, this is partitioning into lipids, non-existent. Adsorption to soil, very high. And adsorption to proteins, measured as adsorption to the human serum albumin with data from medicine, also high. So we have nominally neutral compounds, which are in reality plus minus charged. They are extremely polar. They do not and never adsorb to lipids but they adsorb strongly to soil particles, sludge sediments, and they adsorb strongly to proteins, weird chemicals. OK, this here is a picture of the human serum albumin. Results. Step one, emissions. These here are the emissions in gram per thousand inhabitants and year in Denmark from Medstad Deco, most used by Human usage is tetracycline, followed by ciprofloxacin, doxycycline, trimetropyrin, tefuroxine. This is the calculated concentration in wastewater effluent. And the highest effluent is tefuroxine. 
it's stable and it's water soluble, followed by trimethoprim, tetracycline, doxycycline. So high emissions, high effluent concentration. And in the river, the same. We come up to 100 nanogram per liter concentrations, cefuroxime, trimethoprim, tetracycline, doxycycline, and ciprofloxacin. Sewage sludge, we have another scala. We have microgram per kilogram. And here we come up to 6,000 microgram per kilogram. That means the chemicals leave this treatment plant with the sludge. And then, of course, we find them in soil. We have in soil 100 times higher concentrations than in rivers. Yeah, comparison to measurements. Mm, some disagreement with the simple treat model. There is a trend to overestimation. And then the second step, bioaccumulation and human exposure. Uptake into plants, into fish. We have concentration in grains, in bread, in the nanogram per kilogram range and highest for trimetoprim. We have concentration in fish, also in the nanogram per kilogram range, highest doxycycline, tetracycline. And we have concentration in leaves. And now these chemicals are polar, persistent, and non-volatile, so they end up in the leaves and this is 40,000. So we have by far the highest concentration in leaves, which means the daily intake by humans is much higher with bread, fruit sap, vegetables, these things, than with fish. We have up to one microgram per day uptake with our daily food. And is this true? Well, there are measurements available from various countries. And to have a comparison, we calculated the BCF, the bioconcentration factor, plant to soil. The black bar is our model. This is ciprofloxacin. The model predicts a moderate uptake into roots and leaves. And the various laboratory studies predict a similar, uh, measure a similar uptake. It's obvious that there are variations in the experiments. Tetracycline, we would predict a moderate uptake into root and low uptake into leaves. And the various measurements predict similar results, even higher than we have calculated. And now trimetoprim. I want to tell you this is a log scale, while this is not. So it goes from 100, the measured values, to below 0 0.1. The model is at 0 0.5 for the root and at 20 for the leaves. So it's a little bit difficult to say whether the model is correct when the experimental values vary more than a factor thousand. But they do. I mean, we have seen this in many studies that this uptake into plants is a highly variable thing. And you can get, I have seen, up to 80,000 differences in the same experiment. And then the people come and ask, can you model this? Yeah, of course. <laughs> So the problem is actually variation experiments. The model seems to predict moderately right. Good. What does this tell us? My 40 minutes come to an end. <laughs> Summary and conclusions to this. We have a high usage of antibiotics. And antibiotics kill bacteria, so the biodegradation is not in particular fast. So they are persistent, and this leads to high emissions. We have developed new methods and models for the exposure and the fate in the environment and for the uptake. And these work satisfying, I would say. We are easily in the range of measured data. The most relevant exposure pathway for humans to antibiotics via the environment after emission back is the pathway sewage sludge, soil, food crops. And we need more research. Well, you will wonder now, of course, is this dangerous? But I must say, this is not my problem. This is DTU food. But, <laughs> but the maximum residue levels in meat of trimethoprim <laughs> is 100 microgram per kilogram, and of tetracycline is up to 600 microgram per kilogram. But still, if you have a permanent low exposure, it can lead to resistance. And this is the major problem, I think. Good. Shall I make more? No, no. I want to.
<laughs> I want to thank a thousand times Thomas Holt and Christensen. He's not here today, but he's, of course, the major reason that I'm here today. Anas Baun for introducing, being friend and colleague. Antonio, Charlotte, Wenching, Cecilia, Arno, my students for helping and working with me. My colleagues, my friends, the same, and the EU for funding those that helped in office, and you for listening and being there. Thank you very much.